So I want to welcome everyone to the, uh, I think this is the fifth CGE three minute thesis contest. So the first speaker is going to be Xi'an Wang, who is one of our students from the traffic engineering group. He, he comes from uh, Huanggang. I hope I said that reasonably correctly on the Yangtze River. And he's working on planning, operation and management of automated transport control systems. So, and he's also on the uh, graduate student board. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's presentation. So uh, I'm be, I will be presenting some of my recent work on uh, vehicle automation for regulating mixed traffic. Uh, imagine you are driving on a highway and uh, someone you know, slows down a little bit. So what you could see is that uh, this kind of like uh, speed uh, variation would propagate and uh, amplify backward in the traffic, uh, resulting in the so-called phantom traffic jams. This is actually very uh, serious, this is actually very serious damage to the uh, efficiency of urban transportation systems. So um, big, nowadays everybody is talking about uh, connected and automated vehicles. So uh, we are interested in looking at you know certain ways to control automated vehicles so that this kind of phantom traffic jams can be kind of like uh, eliminate or uh, smoothed out. So uh, we have been able to design a specific class of controllers for automated vehicles. Uh, and we have uh, kind of like implemented this in a simulation setting for the so-called adaptive cruise control uh, vehicles. So what that means is that vehicles uh, with this feature, you know, uh, are able to kind of like uh, control themselves at a certain degree. So you can see that from 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 these figures that uh, the, the the speed variations of you know vehicles can be uh, eliminated and smoothed out with a certain market penetration rate of automated vehicles. Uh, of, of obviously, the effect is increasing with the uh, increase of market penetration rate. As a result, we have been able to observe a much smoother trajectories for all the uh, vehicles following automated vehicles, and this actually had a significant implication for urban transportation system in the sense that uh, with a much smoother trajectory of those vehicles, we are able to uh, significantly uh, reduce vehicle fuel consumptions and the greenhouse gas emissions, which is of course very important in uh, today's world. So I, I do believe that uh, this uh, would be very beneficial for our planet and uh, its people. Uh, thank you for attending. Thanks very much, Shang Wang. So um, next up is Brandon. Brandon uh, is a student, a PhD student working with Professor Feng on in the region of eco hydrology. He comes from um, Chippewa Falls, which is the home of uh, supercomputing and uh, like and cool as beer. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's all you need to know about Brandon at this point. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to him. So we all know that our eating and drinking habits can have an influence on our future. But have you ever thought that a plant's eating and drinking habits could have an influence on your future? Well, when plants are hungry, they open millions of tiny little pores on their leaves and eat atmospheric CO2 while simultaneously drinking large amounts of water through their roots to replace the water that leaves through these open pores. And this diet has a huge impact shown here on climate and greenhouse gases as plants are responsible for eating around 25% of the atmospheric CO2 that we humans emit, as well as returning about 60% of precipitation that falls on the land back to the atmosphere as water vapor. Now to our understanding, plants have done a good job at influencing climate in a way that's good for us humans, but there's doubt as to whether that can continue in the future under current climate projections. So in order to understand how we'll fare in future climate, it might be important to understand how plant diets respond to climate and influence climate. So my PhD research focuses on how we represent plant diet in these climate models. And I'm specifically focused on plant drinking habits as soil dries. And what I've found is that by replacing the very simple empirical relationships in these complex climate models with the physics of how plants actually drink water is critical for representing plant diet. The reason for this is because drinking water by plants, transporting it from the soil to the roots is actually a difficult process. It's stressful because it requires the plant to be drier than the soil. 
okay? And this is analogous to a paper towel. If you take a dry paper towel, dip it in some water, it's drier and it sucks the water up. So by accounting for this additional stress of pulling the water up, you account for more dryness in the plant with these physics-based models. So compared to the empirical models, because the empirical models assume that the soil and the plant are equally dry. So to illustrate this a little better, let's look at a little trial here. So this is representing a certain soil dryness condition for the empirical model versus the physics. And what happens is the empirical model kind of underpredicts how dehydrated it is and is a little bit more indulgent with how it drinks. Whereas the physics-based model can accurately represent how dry it is and decides to conserve its energy for a later time and not to drink. Now these differences may seem kind of small, but if they play out over time, they're very important. So if we were to run these two models over a longer drought simulation, which is shown here, what might happen is that the empirical model would constantly be wrong about how dry it is, and it'd be a little bit reckless with its drinking, and it might end up burning through all of this water supply and dehydrating itself and possibly dying, which is a real drinking problem as shown over here, okay? But the physics-based model is a lot more conservative and is actually sensing how dehydrated it is and is able to better capture the physics. So this is very important for climate change. And uh, thank you. <laughs> so next up is Sajad uh, Bahe Saidi. And uh, he's a student with uh, Ardashir, Ardashir Epitaj. And he's working in the general area of satellite sensing and data assimilation. Hello, my name is Sajjad. Uh, I'm talking about blind spot of snowfall and can the, we want to see can satellite data can deceive us in finding a snowfall or not. You know, snow has a far reaching effects on our daily life, our planet and its climate. And to a study, a studying the science behind the snowfall can help us to understand its impact on weather forecasts, ecology uh, of wildlife, and also our water supply. So uh, on the ground, a snow cover uh, can regulate the temperature of Earth's surface. And once it melts, it can refill the rivers and reservoirs to provide supply for uh, spring and summer. But uh, on a larger scale, a snow cover can uh, impact the uh, heat exchange of, uh, Earth's, of Earth's surface. And <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and, and by affecting that, we can uh, see that it's very important to monitor a snowfall on a global scale. Uh, observing the a snowfall from, uh, from observing the Earth from space can has provided us uh, promising results. And uh, we can uh, use the satellites. Which can, which can capture the, the snowfall and precipitation over the, at the top of the atmosphere. So uh, the, the satellites are able to see through the structure of atmosphere and uh, can capture the precipitation. So uh, we have the water drops in the atmosphere that can emit the radiation that can be captured by the satellites. Also ice particles and snowflakes can scatter this upwelling radiation. So we got something in the middle that can mixed up and we lost the snowfall signatures here in our algorithms. So we implement a hypothesis testing method to uh, link the physical conditions of atmosphere with this uh, statistical learning approach that can uh, help us to uh, estimate the snowfall. Ming Fang Zhang. And uh, he's uh, an, also working on, on intelligent transport systems. Uh, have you experienced a uh, sudden slowdown or stop on while well, driving on highway, even though there's no accidents or no bottlenecks? If yes, you are experiencing a very famous uh, traffic phenomenon called phantom traffic jam. Phantom traffic jam is an emergent property of traffic flow and it's due to human driving behaviors. Such behaviors will also decrease the throughput and increase the fuel consumption and emissions. 
we are more interested in automated vehicles nowadays. So we are curious about how automated vehicles will improve the uh, will will in, influence the, the traffic flow or influence the phantom traffic jam. For automated vehicles, we categorize with high level automated vehicles. Uh, they are um, driver free and controlled by computers. Uh, and the, the other is uh, lower level automated vehicles, and they are very similar to human driven vehicles. However, they can follow automatically with the uh, preceding vehicle by adapting their speed to keep a safe distance. So we call those lower level automated, automated vehicles adaptive cruise control ACC vehicles. And those ACC vehicles are commercially available on market right now. Um, so previous study find high level automated vehicles can improve the traffic flow. However, the impacts of the mixed flow of ACC and human driven vehicles is still unclear. To answer this question, we built a high fidelity model and simulate on highway environments. The results find that uh, compared with purely uh, compared with pure human driven traffic flow, uh, a small number of ACC vehicles, for example, 40% of ACC vehicles may, uh, may incur more uh, and faster traffic oscillations or tra uh, phantom traffic jams. And it will even more decrease the throughput and even more increase the fuel consumption and emissions. Therefore, we can say uh, the, uh, the, AC, the mixed flow of ACC and uh, human driven vehicles may negatively impact the traffic flow. Are you discouraged from buying an ACC vehicle? Don't be disappointed. <laughs> so our findings enable uh, next generation control for mixed traffic with ACC vehicles. Uh, for example, ramp metering technologies to using ramp, ramp metering technologies to regulate the traffic flow and maximize the throughput and uh, decrease the uh, 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 decrease the fuel consumption and emissions and enjoy your ACC vehicles in the near future. <laughs> Thanks. Jialong Li and uh, Jialong, your career, right? South, South Korea. Korea, yeah. And you've been at the lab like two or three years, I think. Yeah. 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 And you're getting close to finishing, I believe, right? So. Okay. <laughs> So uh, this beautiful image on the left shows you the mouth of the uh, Mississippi River in Louisiana, where the river meets the ocean. Uh, this uh, region is uh, called uh, Delta, and these places are a home for many animals and plants and humans. But unfortunately, this area have been uh, disappearing around the world. Uh, for example, this uh, Mississippi River Delta has lost about 70% of its land area since uh, 1932. Uh, there are many reasons for this land loss, such as sea level rise or subsidence, but one of the important reasons is uh, poor river management. Uh, one good example would be uh, dams uh, in, uh, constructed upstream of a river, which can trap sand and decrease the sand supply to these delta regions. So uh, it is uh, the, to, to better understand what is happening and what will happen to uh, earth landscape in the future, it is important to know how much sand is available and how they travel in a river. Uh, the, the figures on the right show you an example of measured river bathymetry. As you can see, uh, there are uh, the various sizes of sand waves. Um, for instance, uh, there are small sand waves and uh, they are on top of uh, large sand waves. And then the large ones are marked with the red dashed lines. And those sand waves are found to present different behaviors depending on the sizes and such multi-scale uh, geometries and uh, scale dependent behaviors of the sand waves, uh, it is making it really hard for us to monitor how much sand uh, transported in a river. So um, for this region, our estimation can be easily off by orders of magnitudes. Uh, so my PhD thesis focuses on uh, how those uh, various sizes of sand wave behave differently and how they carry sand in a river. So I developed uh, the, the sand wave tracking algorithm to quantify their characteristics. And now I'm currently developing a mathematical model to estimate how much sand transported in a river using spectral analysis. 
uh, my recent analysis suggests that these uh, small sand waves on uh, this on the bed surface are mainly responsible for transporting the sand and they uh, drive migration of these large sand waves. Uh, this research uh, will help uh, improve our understanding on um, the earth surface processes. And also this research uh, can be used to build uh, practical guidelines for monitoring sand budget in a river. Uh, and also I believe uh, my research also can contribute to better monitoring human impacts on riverine systems and also evaluating uh, the landscape sustainability. Thanks for listening. Svetlana, who's a student with Sonia Mogolevsky. And um, Svetlana is going to, is interested in uh, an analysis and numerical calculations of metamaterials effectively. I think that's a reasonable description of your research. And I think that's one of the things you're going to talk about today. So when you're ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Svetlana Baranova, and today I'd like to talk about some results related to my thesis work. The uh, goal of my research is uh, to develop a methodology to accurately model thin layers. There are several ways how to do it, and one of them is related to uh, substituting thin layer by a zero thickness interface with proper jump condition that's supposed to mimic the presence of layer. Uh, the well-established methodology of such kind is uh, the one developed by Bobic and Bedziniste, and the key element of this methodology is the use of truncated Taylor series expansions. The truncation order defines the interface model, meaning that uh, um, higher order models means better accuracy, all right? Um, I use this methodology for the problems governed by Laplace equations, and it was quite successful. I got an interface uh, models up to any desirable order and for uh, the, any arbitrary curvature of the interface. And next, I moved to the linear elastic problems, and I developed first and second order models. Uh, to verify the models, I used benchmark problem uh, of infinite coated fiber. And I compared its result with the corresponding interface problem with obtained jump conditions. Uh, the results of both models were quite good for the soft and moderately stiff layers. However, once I started checking very stiff layers, I found a paradox. The first order model provided a better result than the second order model when it's supposed to be vice versa. Uh, I was really puzzled by this fact, uh, and not only I, Benvenista was struggling with the same issue. He even wrote that the construction of the higher order models uh, remains an open issue. It was in 2010. Since then, for my best knowledge, uh, the issue remains open and uh, no one um, attempted to get higher order models. Some scientists even questioned if methodology works at all. I was really devastated to see such comments because, you know, it is my research and thesis. Uh, so, and uh, I started going deeper and decided to get third order model and check it on the same example. And you already can see that the story had a happy ending. The third order model gave a very accurate results. That's three main conclusions. First of all, uh, the methodology works. Secondly, third order models was obtained uh, in the first time. And third, it especially for grad students, don't give up, be persistent in your work, and then you'll be able to overcome any issue. Thank you. Thanks for ending on such a positive note, Stefano. So um, let's um, give a round of applause to all the speakers. They did such a terrific job. So the, uh, the the judges have returned. They're looking very somber. <laughs> Lauren. Um, well, this was a really tough decision, actually, because we had um, several top favorites. Uh, but we have to make a decision, unfortunately. Um, so um, so the, uh, the top was Jiang Li uh, with the discuss of sand waves. And the runner up was Ming Feng Shang. Um, um, but we really did enjoy all of them. So um, it was a really tough call. So but thank you guys all. They were fantastic.
So thanks, Lauren. Thanks, um, Sue and uh, Mariah. That was great. It's great, uh, great talks all around, and I, I think I, the decision is really good. I think everyone's talk was great. That's, that's good. Now we come to the People's Choice Award, and um, it was that was also very close. As I said, it was like the Eurovision Song Contest because the outside votes were coming in, kind of warped things around. So what might be whatever. I'm not going to make too much fuss about it. I'm, but it's a very, very for me, it's a very, very pleasing outcome for the People's Choice Award. And I'm, I'm really pleased that it came out this way. It's not one of the two winners. So the People's Choice Award or the Minnesota Nice Awards goes to Slepvana. So if you can come forward and get your... Normally, I get to say that they can keep it in their office. I'm not sure where your office is these days, right? Your home, right? Well, but I want to get it back because I know you're going to be finishing soon. I understand, so I have to make sure that it gets kept. But I, I really thought it got lost in the pandemic. It was buried deep down in the vault of uh, Sapple, and each time I have to look for it, I sent out desperate emails. And eventually someone owned up where it was and they returned it this morning. So anyway, so look after it for the short time you have it, Savannah. I'm really pleased you won it. It's great. Thank you very much. And congratulations to the to the up to the to the winners going on in the contest. I'm sure they're going to do really well for us. Yes. Okay, uh, last speaker, and I'll keep this brief. Uh, of course, a number of people I'd like to congratulate. Uh, so of course the speakers, uh, the three winners, um, all six did a marvelous job, a really nice showcase of research within the department. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the faculty advisors, uh, really nice work. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the judges, uh, two internal and one external. Thank you so much, Sue. So with that, uh, next year, we'll do this again. <laughs> Thank you.